Good evening. It's Leonid Meteor time, and we just might have a spectacular shower of shooting stars. I don't really think we will. Anyway, moonlight interferes, but it's just possible, and it's worthwhile keeping a watch out. We might do far better this time next year. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to send back stunning pictures. It's been looking at the colliding galaxies known as the antennae. And there are the antennae, as seen from the Anglo-Australian Telescope on Earth, and here is the Hubble picture, showing an immense amount of detail, particularly right inside them. I think would agree Hubble's power is immense. Much nearer home, the Cassini-Huygens probe to Saturn is off to a good start. It's on its way. It'll get there in the year 2004, and we hope drop the Huygens probe down onto the surface of Saturn's largest satellite, Titan, and tell us for the first time what that remarkable world is really like. On Mars, we've now lost contact with this Sojourner rover, but it's done very well indeed and told us more than we dared to hope. And Mars' global surveyor is now going round and round the red planet, sending back excellent pictures. And now, on to our main theme this evening. Many people think that all stars look white. Well, that isn't so. And now that we're coming on to darker skies, this may be a good time to say something about star colors in general. So let's begin by having a look at that lovely constellation, Orion, now in the southeast. It's very easy to find, and there are two particularly bright stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel. And you can't mistake them. Betelgeuse is quite clearly orange-red, and Rigel is put in white. And there's a picture taken by Douglas Arnold from his star atlas, and that shows Orion very well. You can see the color of Betelgeuse, the three stars of the belt, right or lower right-hand corner, and below the belt, the famous Orion Nebula, and I'll come back to that later on. So Orion is there. Overhead, we see Capella in Auriga, the charioteer, and that is a yellow star. Note the little triangle stars close beside it. The same color as the sun, although in fact Capella is very much more luminous, about 200 times as much. Now that's the overhead now. In summer evenings, the overhead position is taken by Vega in Lyra, about the same brightness as Capella, but very different in color. Capella is yellow, Vega is strongly blue. Now these colors are quite pronounced, particularly when you use binoculars, and they indicate differences in surface temperature. We know that color depends upon temperature, and light is a wave motion. The red light is the longest wavelength, violet the shortest, and that goes to order of temperature. The red heat is cooler than yellow, yellow cooler than white, and white cooler than blue. And using instruments called spectroscopes, we can examine the spectra of the stars and find out what's there. So let's begin with a typical star, our own sun. Well, the sunlight is passed through a glass prism or something, or the equivalent, and split up and the different wavelengths are bent or refracted unequally, and what you get is a rainbow band from red at the wrong wave end through to violet at the short wave end. And in the case of the sun, this band is crossed by dark lines, and each of these lines is characteristic of some particular element or group of elements. For example, those two lines on the yellow part are due to the element sodium, and they can't be due to anything else. Now, when you look at the spectrum of an incandescent solid, or liquid, or gas at high pressure, what you see is a rainbow, continuous spectrum. But when you look at the spectrum of a gas under low pressure, you don't see a rainbow, you see disconnected bright lines. In the case of the sun, a combination of the two. In fact, the sun's bright surface, or photosphere, is made up of high pressure gas, and that gives a rainbow background. Outside that is a layer of lower pressure gas, the chromosphere, and that should give an area of bright lines. But those bright lines are seen silhouetted against the rainbow background, and therefore they are reversed and they appear dark. Their positions and their intensities are not altered, and therefore we can identify them. And those two dark lines in the sun spectrum indicate that there must be sodium there. And by now, we have identified many elements in the sun, and we know that the most plentiful element there is hydrogen. And that is no surprise, because hydrogen is by far the most plentiful element in the entire universe, and the sun contains a great deal of it. And obviously, the stars, which are suns, also yield spectra. About 80 years ago, two astronomers, Hertzsprung in Denmark, Russell in America, drew up diagrams known as HR, or Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. And these are immensely important. What they did was to plot the stars according to their luminosities and their surface temperatures. And there's the background of an HR diagram. On the bottom, the surface temperatures from over 100,000 degrees under 3,000. And on the left-hand side 
the luminosities, and normally we take the sun as being equal to one. And now let's put in one or two stars. The sun, temperature on the surface just below 6,000 degrees, and by definition, luminosity one. Betelgeuse, much cooler, but 15,000 sun power, there it is. Rigel, much hotter, and this time, 60,000 sun power. And the stars are divided into definite spectral classes, denoted by letters of the alphabet. It's a rather chaotic alphabet, the sequence goes O, B, A, F, G, K, N, in order of decreasing surface temperature. The famous mnemonic, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me, which is still used, even though there are howls of anguish from the politically correct brigade. Now let's look at a much fuller HR diagram. And most of the stars are grouped between the stripes B and M, and there's a line that you can see called the main sequence. And most of the stars are in that. Our sun is a typical G-type star in the yellow part. And to the top right, we see the red giant branch. Now this was worked out by Hertzsprung and Russell, and Russell in particular thought this might be an evolutionary sequence. And in a way, of course, he was right, although not in the way he expected. We know, and he knew, a star begins its career by condensing out of the interstellar material in a nebula, a patch of dust and gas. We know one famous nebula, M42 in Oran, below the Hunter's Belt, easily seen with the naked eye, binoculars show it well, and of course, photographs show it excellently. And a photograph here by David Malin shows the intricate detail inside. And that is a stellar nursery inside which fresh stars are being created all the time. And Russell knew that, and he worked out a complete life cycle of a star. So let's have a look at Russell's plan. A star begins by condensing out of a nebula, and the first is large, cool, and red. It then shrinks by gravity and heats up, and begins to cross the HR diagram, becoming first the orange, then yellow, and then joining the HR diagram at the top left as a hot white star. And that is the peak of its career. It then begins to fade and slides gently down the main sequence, becoming a cold red dwarf, and finally a black dwarf with no light and heat left. That was Russell's scheme, very nice, very plausible, and completely wrong, because Russell didn't know how a star shines. He believed that a star like the sun shines simply by contraction and using gravitational energy. And that's not so. A star shines by what we call nuclear reactions. And the main fuel is hydrogen. So consider the sun. Deep inside the sun, the temperature is colossal, about 15 million degrees, and the pressure is colossal. And very strange things are happening. The hydrogen bits are building up into bits of another element, helium. It takes four bits of hydrogen to make one bit of helium, and every time this happens, a little energy is set free, and a little mass, or weight if you like, is lost. It's that energy that keeps the sun shining, and the loss in mass is quite staggering, about four million tons every second. Therefore, the sun weighs a lot less now than it did when I started talking to you, but please don't worry, there's plenty left. The sun has been shining now for at least 5,000 million years, and is no more than middle aged. So the entire thing is different from Russell's conception. So let's have a look now at what really happens. Everything depends upon a star's initial mass when it condenses out of the nebula. So begin with a star that's very much less massive than the sun. It contracts, begins to shine by heat, but the nuclear ash is not triggered off. The surface temperature never reaches the required value of about 10 million degrees, so the star simply shines very feebly, cool and red, and then fades away to become a cold, dead, black dwarf star. Although I must say, there's a serious doubt as to whether our universe is yet old enough for any black dwarfs to form, but they will one day. Now consider a star like our sun, or rather like our sun in mass. Again, it begins inside a nebula, shrinks by gravity, heats up, and then the temperature in the middle rises to about 10 million degrees. Nuclear reactions are triggered off, hydrogen uses a fuel, the star enters the main sequence, and there it stays for a very long time, in fact, most of its life, and it goes on shining quite steadily, as our sun's doing now. But obviously, it depends upon hydrogen fuel, and that supply will not last indefinitely. There's going to come a time when that fuel is used up, and then a star like the sun has got to change. The inside shrinks, the outside blows out, and the sun leaves the main sequence and enters the giant branch, becomes a red giant as on Aldebaran in Taurus is now. Follow the line of the belt upwards and look under Aldebaran, looking rather like Betelgeuse, although in fact it's not nearly so luminous or so far away. 
Um, when that happens to our sun, as it will do one day, I very much fear that's going to be the end of our Earth. For a time, the sun in this giant stage will send out about a hundred times as much energy as it does now, and the Earth can't survive that. But luckily, I say, don't get alarmed. That won't happen for about four to five thousand million years yet. Well, what next? The star then blows off its outer layers and becomes what we call a planetary nebula. And there's a picture of a planetary nebula, the helix. In the middle, you see the old star and the surrounding layers being blown away. Here's another one, the dumbbell in Vipecula. And here, the ring nebula in Lyra. And that's a picture that we took in the Sky at Night program using the Isaac Newton telescope on the Canary Isles. I may say it's a bad name because a planetary nebula is not really a nebula and nothing would ever to do with a planet. Anyway, eventually, the outer layers are blown away completely and all you're left with is the star's remnant, and all the atoms there are crushed, broken, and packed together with almost no waste space, so the density is amazingly high. And a star like that, an old bankrupt star, is known as a white dwarf. Now let's come back to the Orion area and have a look at Sirius, the dog star, the great dog. You can't mistake it. So bright, it outshines everything else. In fact, Sirius is a pure white star. It's not alone in space. It has a companion. And because Sirius is known as the dog star, the companion is often known as the pup. And there it is. These spikes are, of course, purely optical. But you can see the pup there, about six o'clock of the clock face, a tiny speck below the white star. Only one ten thousandth as bright as Sirius itself. So the difference in mass is not very really great because the pup is so dense, about a hundred thousand times as dense as water. It's already passed through the red giant stage. They're now shining only because they're very slowly shrinking, and nothing but extinction awaits it. And our sun will become a white dwarf one day. Now consider a star that's far more massive than our sun, should we say 10 times massive. Everything happens at an accelerated pace. As before, the star begins by condensing outer material inside a nebula, uh, nucleus triggered off, it goes to the main sequence, then enters the giant stage. But then it dies much more spectacularly. When the hydrogen and fuel is used up, energy production stops, there's a sudden implosion, followed by an explosion, and the star literally blows itself to pieces in what we call a supernova outburst, and then for a time can shine as brightly as an entire galaxy. The last supernova we saw with the naked eye in our galaxy goes back to 16.4, but in 1987, one blazed up in the large clouds of Magellan, a southern galaxy, about 170,000 light years away. And there's a picture of that supernova. I may say, we saw it in 1987, but because the large cloud is 170,000 light years away, we were actually watching something that happened 170,000 years ago. Once we look beyond our own immediate neighborhood, our view of the universe is bound to be very out of date. Many of these supernovae held up as, as patches of expanding gas, in the middle of which are things called pulsars, made up of neutrons and incredibly dense. The most famous one is the Crab Nebula in Taurus, known to be the wreck of a star seen by Chinese and Japanese astronomers way back in the year 1054. And there is the patch of expanding gas you can see with a small telescope. And right in the middle of that is the Crab's powerhouse, the pulsar, a tiny thing made of neutrons and so dense, well, um, a cupful of neutron star material would weigh more than an ocean liner. And again, nothing but extinction finally awaits it. So you see, all in all, Russell was partly right and partly wrong. The HR diagram is an evolutionary sequence, but to no fault of his own, he made one great mistake. He imagined that the red giant stars were young, and in fact they're not, they're highly evolved, they are stellar OAPs. So now, let's have a look at certain selected stars and begin with Betelgeuse, the brilliant red supergiant in the top left corner of Orion, the colors easily see with naked eye. Betelgeuse is huge. The diameter is about 250 million miles, and that is enough to swallow up the entire path of the Earth around the Sun. The outer layers are very verified, and the interior is very dense. And no doubt Betelgeuse will one day go off as a supernova. In Orion, Rigel, in the lower right-hand corner, not nearly so big, but much more luminous, 900 light years away. So we see it now, not as it is today, but as it used to be in the time when the Normans ruled England. And now come down to Sirius again. I say eight and a half light years away, 
one of our nearest fellow neighbors, and about 26 times as powerful as the sun. And Sirius is, in fact, a pure white star of spectral type A. But look at it, and you'll see it seems to flash various colors of the rainbow. And that has nothing to do with Sirius itself. Star twinkling is due entirely to the Earth's dirty, unsteady atmosphere that sort of shakes the starlight about. And the star that's overhead will twinkle much less than the star that's low down, with the lights coming to us through a much lower air of atmosphere. And Sirius twinkles very strongly because, first of all, it's very bright, and secondly, from here, it's never very high up. Other colors, the twins in Gemini, not far from around, Pollux and Castor. Pollux is the brighter of the two, and quite clearly orange in color, and Castor, there it is. There's Castor white, and Pollux is orange, and Castor is a very fine double star. And then, what about Aldebaran, the orange-red giant in Taurus? Well, it's a very nice star, about the same brightness as Betelgeuse, but I say not nearly so luminous and much closer to us. And extending from it is the little V-shaped cluster of the Hyades. But oddly enough, Aldebaran is not really a member of the Hyades. It merely lies halfway between the Hyades and ourselves. And beyond Aldebaran in the sky, the seven sisters of Pleiades, I'll come back to those in a few minutes. And then what about our familiar plow, Ursa Major, the Great Bear? Well, there are colors there too. Of the seven famous stars making up the plow, six are white, but the seventh is not. The two pointers are Dupe and Merrick, and Dupe, the point of the pole star, is quite clearly orange, and you'll see that very clearly if you use binoculars. The pole star is pretty well white. And there's a picture of the plow, and you can just about see there that Dupe is decidedly orange. Hmm. And then, what about Cassiopeia, on the other side of the pole from the plow? The famous W of stars, which never sets over here. And of those stars, five are white, and the second shed here, again, is orange. You can just about see the color of the naked eye, and binoculars bring it out very well indeed. And um, lastly, what about the Pleiades or Seven Sisters, that lovely cluster? The stars there are very hot, bluish-white, and by stellar standards, very young. And that's a picture taken with a large telescope, and you can see there the nebulosity, indicating the cluster really is young, and star formation there is still going on. But I wonder, how many stars in the Pleiades can you see with the naked eye alone? Try it. If you see seven, you're doing pretty well. Got for a dozen, you're doing very well indeed. Use binoculars, and you will see dozens. And they really do make up a connected star cluster by far the finest of the kind in the sky. And as I say, by stellar standards, they are very, very young, and that's why you have nebulosity there. So in Gilgrey, there are plenty of color in the sky. Uh, with the naked eye, you can see quite a lot. With binoculars and telescopes, well, look around, and you'll see that many of these star colors are really vivid. And their colors have told us a great deal about the way in which a star lives and how it dies. Well, don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, dial up on the information line, 0891 or CFAX page 620. And when I come back next month, I'm going to be joined by Professor Chris Kitchen, and we're going to say more about those extraordinary super-dense stars known as the White Dwarfs. So until next month, good night.